Welcome, everybody. This is uh, our session 5A with uh, Dr. Michelle Pekansky Brock. Can professional development lead to more humanized online STEM courses? And before we get started, I just want to run over a few logistics with everyone. First, um, we are being recorded for our colleagues who couldn't join us in real time. Some people are asleep now in, in Europe and maybe not awake yet in, in uh, New Zealand, but uh, we're excited to have everyone joining us, whether you're watching the recording or you're here live. Um, we do have the captions enabled. And so if you wish to use them, you just have to go to the button uh, down below that says close caption and choose live transcript. If uh, you don't see that button, you might have to select the more with the three dots. Uh, sometimes the, the screen size makes a difference. Um, but we will be um, also looking for your comments and questions in the chat. So use that chat function to share your ideas and maybe related links as ideas pop up from our speaker today. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Michelle Pekansky brock from the California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative and Foothill De Anza Community College District. We are so pleased to have you joining us and sharing all the amazing work you've been doing. So I will hand the baton to you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for having me here today. And thank you to you and all of the people who have put so much work into this conference. Trust me, I know how much work it is. <laughs> it's, every year I go, wow, they're doing this again. <laughs> That's a big undertaking. So um, congratulations on its um, success and thank you for your efforts. Um, so I'm here today to present, can PD lead to more humanized online STEM courses? And um, as part of the work that I do at the state level for the California Community Colleges, I am um, half my time for the past three years has been spent on a $1.5 million grant project that is examining this question and really trying to understand if we, if we develop professional development to do something, how do we know if it's working? And what is the impact of this concept of humanizing, this model of humanizing on students, particularly in STEM classes? So I'm gonna be sharing some preliminary research data with you. And I gotta be honest with you that this presentation is new to me. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not gonna to cram too much information into this, but I don't like getting into the, the research findings until I tell you a little bit about what humanizing is. So we're gonna actually start there. Um, and to do so, I'd like to ask you to take just a moment and reflect on your life and identify one memorable teacher who's positively influenced you. And in your mind, come up with two words, two separate words that describe that person. And as you do that, I'm going to give you a link to add your two words. That link is in the chat. It will open like this on your screen. You just have to scroll down a little bit to see the two fields to enter your two words and then you'll click on submit. And if you prefer, you can use your phone to scan the code on the screen. And when you're done, type done in the chat. So I have a sense of how we're doing. Okay, looks like a lot of people are done, but you can keep working at that. I'm going to show you the results and it, it's not going to close. So keep adding if you're still typing. I'm going to actually give you the, the link to look at this on your own end because I know that it's small on my screen and I promise I will verbalize these. And I'll explain what we're looking at. Okay, let me see if I can, I don't know if it helps at all if I make this bigger. Um, 
here's the deal. There's actually 376 people who have added to this. I keep adding to this as I do presentations. So I've been doing this for a few months. And every time someone enters a word, this, and as typical word clouds work, the more frequently a word is used, the bigger it gets. And so if we look at this, I'm not going to read all the words. I'm just going to read the few, the, the few biggest ones. Kind, caring, encouraging, supportive, empathetic, compassionate. Okay? Those are words that are consistently up there at the top. It's fascinating to me. All right. So I want everyone to keep that in mind as we move forward with this presentation today. Okay. Now what we're going to do is take a look at the two images that you see on the screen and we're going to deconstruct them a little bit. Okay. So on the left side of the screen, you see a hockey player, right? And that hockey player is doing something. That hockey player is protecting his goal. And there's another player coming in from the side, trying to get the puck into that goalie, right? Trying to get it past the goalie. The goalie's job is to keep that puck out of the net. These two people, that player and that hockey goalie, they're both playing the same game, but they're not on the same team. They're competing against each other. Now on the right side of the screen, you see a soccer player and a coach on the sideline of a field. The coach and player are looking out together what we assume to be the game happening on the field. The coach is pointing and giving the player guidance to improve her game. These two are on the same team. They have different roles, but they're working together to achieve the same goal. I have worked with faculty for more than 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, I stepped out of my full-time teaching role and I've been working in a faculty support role since then. In my interactions with college faculty, I find that most of them will voice an interest in being like the image on the right. They want to mentor and guide their students. They want to be a person that students fondly remember in life. And I often find that the reason for not having that type of relationship tends to be something when I ask folks, you know, well, why doesn't that happen? It's usually some reference to like, well, the students don't bring it, right? It's something about what's happening on the student side. But I also find that faculty are very influenced without even realizing it, unconsciously influenced by the notion of what a professor is supposed to be like. This social construct, this cultural construct of a professor and the deficit-based thinking used to relate to students really undermine our natural human instincts to connect with our students. And these cultural constructs work in powerful ways to encourage us to adopt practices and policies in courses that make us feel more like gatekeepers to our students than you know, a mentor or a coach. So for those of you um, who are in a teaching role here, I want you to reflect on your own identity as a professor. Each of you enter this topic from a different positionality, myself included. You bring different social identities, but you also bring the shared experiences of having completed a graduate degree. And that means in your own experiences as a student, you've been influenced by these notions when you're in that role of a student. Now, as we engage in this conversation about equity, it's really focused on removing barriers that disproportionately impact students, right? And in the data, we know that race and ethnicity are common denominators among disproportionately impacted groups. Um, some barriers are easier to see than others. And we're here today to talk about some hard ones. One of the reasons why cultural bar barriers are so hard to see is because it depends on where you're standing. If you're in the center versus the margins. As Mahabali has said, things look very different from the margins than they do from the center. Myself, someone who has an, a cultural identity who is very much centered in white dominant culture, right? A lot of this stuff has been invisible to me for a very long time. And I continue to work on it and I continue to learn. We need to recognize that higher education in the US is the product of white dominant culture. Universities were designed at the outset to keep particular people out and privilege others. This is the history of our workplaces and the legacy of this racist, sexist, ableist past is still very much at play in the structures of higher education. And oftentimes we just don't see it. 
even if we have very good intentions. So for many of us, particularly those of us who are white, cisgendered, able-bodied, neurotypical, and or have access to financial resources and cultural capital, and I could continue and I include myself in this group, it can be extremely difficult to understand that how we teach influences who succeeds in our courses. We also need to recognize that humans are social beings. All of us, all of us crave connection and belonging. Research has shown that the two things people fear most in the world are physical pain and social rejection. Belonging is central to the research about improving equity, and it's particularly important in STEM. But what is belonging? We often hear this word thrown around. I found it really helpful to understand that belonging is different from fitting in. To belong, a person needs to feel valued for their true authentic self. In college, students who feel valued and respected for who, for their true authentic selves, they're more likely to persist in a course. They're more likely to stick with it. And they're more likely to persist through a degree program. And the same is true for faculty and staff. This isn't just about teaching. This is, a, this is about an inclusive way of life, folks. The same is true for all humans. But fitting in, on the other hand, means something different. Fitting in means you need to change who you are to be accepted. When a human is expected to change who they are to conform with others' norms, it's not a healthy experience. It's stressful, painful, and toxic. It's dehumanizing. Okay, so we want to keep that in mind as we move forward and think about um, you know, becoming, building this kind of self-awareness. And that's part of the professional development that I'm going to be sharing with here today. Um, this is a quote. I know some of you have seen my work, has seen before. I absolutely love this quote. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Hold on to that. Think about that and apply that to your work, regardless of how you're coming into this conversation. Whether you support faculty, whether you're working with students, um, keep that in mind, okay? When I talk about the word humanizing, this is essentially the crux of what I mean by humanizing. Instructor to student relationships are the connective tissue between students' engagement in learning. And that's true for any modality. This isn't groundbreaking news, okay? Um, it's not groundbreaking news. This is research that comes out of um, culturally responsive teaching. We can turn to Geneva Gay, we can turn to Gloria Ladson Billings. We can turn to um, Zaretta Hammond. And the people I'm noting are people of color. The people I'm noting are people who have done research and lots and lots of, of research and contributions and how to support my, racially minoritized students, how to support students coming into higher education from low income backgrounds who are also first generation students. I'd add Laura Rendon to that list as well. And as part of this, this, you know, it's not just about the interactions. It's not just about, okay, I'll post announcements, right? It's really about developing a connection. And for me, at the root of this, the thing that we really have to reconceive and transform, which is super hard, is the traditional relationship between what we think of as a professor and how that professor is supposed to relate to his or her students. Um, and we can think about it as being framed around positional authority which is the traditional relationship where we see a professor positioned above students, right? Um, and really kind of dictating over students and controlling and, and really, you know, the one who controls the environment. And you see in this, this sculptural frieze here, which by the way, is positioned over the doors of the Yale Law School um, doorway in the building. If you were to walk, walk in, you'd see it over the, the, the top, which, as an art historian, I can tell you that if you go back to medieval uh, um, or Gothic architecture in Western art history in Europe, you would find a view of the last judgment over the doorway. And I find that, that parallel very intriguing for those of you familiar with the last judgment. Um, so yeah, how can we shift that? And a more equitable type of relationship is one that stems in relational authority. Relational authority is when we take the time to get to know who our students are, we validate them as humans, 
We recognize all of the experiences that they're bringing in, into the course with them, and we create space for that. We ensure that our students are seen. And this is essentially the foundation of culturally responsive teaching. Um, we also use the concept of a warm demander in the professional development that I'm going to be talking with you about. Warm demander comes from the work of Judith Kleinfeld, who did research on Alaskan Native students. So why STEM? As I'm focusing here on STEM, this is true for all courses. It's true for all students. It's more important for students who bring in experiences of discrimination and racism into the course, all right? That's why relationships are more important. And in STEM, we know from research that that, that intensity of that climate is, is kind of kicked up a bit in STEM disciplines. We know that the equity gaps are bigger in STEM than any other culture uh, discipline cluster. And I don't have the citation for this specific article, but there's an article from 2019 by an author named Regal Crum um, that I can get the link or the, the citation for if you're interested that actually shows they do a comparison with, with different disciplines. So we wanna keep that in mind. And, and I just wanna acknowledge that that is why we are focusing on STEM. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent over the past several years on trying to prove, improve this problem. Some of those solutions turn to technology. Some of those improve, uh, solutions turn to mentoring programs. There isn't one solution, but the one we're focusing on is instructor to student relationships. And as I mentioned, it's even more important for racially minoritized students. Um, and this is a book that I want to just full acknowledgement I have not read. I saw it yesterday and I read the reviews and I got so interested and I've already ordered it. It's arriving this weekend and I plan to dig into it then. Um, yes, keeping this in the context of innovation, understanding that diversity is important, not only because it's the right thing to do, not only because we should be striving for equity, but it's also important because diversity makes teams stronger. It's an asset. And in STEM, the kinds of problems that the STEM workforce is solving today and moving forward, I think we all agree that we need to be as strong as possible to improve these sticky problems. The other barrier that I wanna focus on is we frame this kind of lack of relationship, instructor to student relationship as a barrier which by the way is it's one of the reasons why we see, let me go back. Well, I'll stay here. It's one of the reasons why we do see bigger equity gaps in STEM um, in online courses is because in online courses, when we ask our students, we, under, we start to learn that there's more likely the kind of this perception of, I don't know who I'm learning from. I don't know who my instructor is. And depending on the cultural background of a student that can be imperative to know before they can lean into a class, all right? So the other barriers that I wanna kind of bust is the need to really get over this deficit-based thinking about students and online courses. And if you know me, you know that I'm a huge advocate for online courses. I wanna call out squarely here that in the California Community College systems before COVID, before COVID, more than 25% of our enrollments in our system came from asynchronous online courses. Community colleges in the United States have led the way for online courses for decades. And it's because of the students we serve. It's because more of our students don't have the privilege to be on campus for their full load. And that's why online courses are critical and they're really an important part of equity, but they have to be done well and intentionally. So we see these words, these statements in the media, which do us no good. They really kind of fuel these negative mindsets, these deficit-based mindsets about online courses. I'll let you read some of the clips here. This first one on the left came from 2019. So pre-COVID, um, weakest students are more likely to take online classes, but do worse in them, right? You can see how that's a very deficit-based approach to both students, but also online classes, because it's kind of lays out this assumption that online classes can't be interactive. And I know who's here today, Denise Madulu williams you are a superstar. Um, I follow Denise on Instagram and on Twitter. And I, I mean, her 
messages that she sends to her students that she also shares on Instagram and video make my day. I'll sometimes look at them as I'm going to bed at night and I just go, oh, Denise, I'm so glad you're happy in this world. So um, yes, share in the chat, share in the chat, share your love, share your, your ideas. Um, and then also the, the, the chancellor for Northeastern University, Ken Henderson said back in January, um, that one of the many lessons of pandemic is that in-person learning remains the gold standard. And when Dr. Henderson said that, it, it hurt me inside a little bit because it's a very privileged way of looking at what we mean by higher education. For those who have access to the resources to be able to consider higher education experience, absolutely, right? But that is leaving out a lot of the students and it's a lot of the students that we serve here. So I hope that we can be thinking more inclusively about how we serve students and positioning online courses as something that is an imperative for us to improve upon for our students. So the question here is how do we remove these barriers? Well, I believe that we need to identify characteristics of impactful professional development that foster self-awareness. So this kind of awareness of what one's positionality, unconscious biases, et cetera, and change mindsets about online courses and students. And we wanna norm professional development as equity infrastructure. Please use that phrase. <laughs> I want it to spread. That requires institutional investment. I know that there are people here in this call right now who do professional development and people dole it out like a deck of cards. Professional development turns into the kitchen sink approach. That's not how it's gonna work, folks. If we want this done well, and if we really wanna improve these difficult problems, institutions need to invest in it, hire people who are, not to say you aren't qualified, but I'm sure you know where I'm going, right? There's only a certain degree that one person can take on or that a person can take on. We need to be diversifying who is also doing the professional development and sharing our resources. And so that's where this grant comes in that I mentioned early in the beginning. Um, I've been lead PI on a California Education Learning Lab grant for the past three years. I'm gonna skip over a lot of these details and I did intend to actually share my slides. Sorry, folks, let me get that for you. So you can loop back to these as you'd like. Um, there's a lot of details on these slides that I, I didn't necessarily intend to read, but I do wanna point that it's administered by Foothill De Anza Community College District, which is where I work, with support from Modesto Junior College, Foothill College, and Cal Poly Humboldt. And I wanna put a shout out to Paula Shales, who is here in the audience. Uh, we had STEM faculty and faculty support specialists go through the academy that I'm about to talk about. Um, and Paula was one instructional designer from Foothill College who went through the academy. So Paula, I hope that you'll, um, you'll feel free to share some, some of your takeaways in the, the chat. Thanks for being here. So we designed an academy. It's a six week professional development academy called the Humanizing Online STEM Academy. It's fully asynchronous and it included during our grant period, eight institutions from the CCC system and the CSU system. Um, as I mentioned, whoops, oh, and I should say 82 folks completed it and were awarded with an $1,800 stipend at the end of the academy. We really wanted to recognize and reward the hard work, particularly at a time when there was so much fatigue and particularly professional development fatigue was happening. Um, and so that stipend folks is really important. We had a very high success rate that I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, it's fully asynchronous, which is important. Fully asynchronous, there was no Zoom. Okay. It was designed in Canvas. It focused on equity in STEM through positive instructor to student relationships online. It was grounded in culturally responsive pedagogy and the social psychological aspects of learning. And another important part was that it really immersed faculty and faculty support specialists in the use of different technology. So a lot of hands-on work, a lot of hands-on work to really improve the digital fluency. This Academy, the six week course is now available in the Canvas Commons. It is openly licensed. 
Um, to find it, you would search uh, using the hashtag humanizing STEM. So uh, Sophia, currently we have a uh, grant application in, and if we get that grant, we will be extending the academy, but only to certain institutions that we've already actually got some connections going with. Um, we're hoping to continue the momentum and be able to facilitate it to the state as well. Um, so beyond that plan, I can't share anything more right now, um, but we do hope that some colleges will make it um, available locally. I know it's a lot of work to facilitate and I don't wanna underscore that. Um, thank you for sharing that, Yang, that's great. All right, okay, so let's move forward here. Whoops, click the wrong button there. Okay, so in the academy, um, what we do is we, we focus on, we really hone in on what we're calling the high opportunity zone of week zero through one and getting in faculty and faculty support specialists to really think about what we mean by that. This is when threat is high. It's when belongingness and certainty is high. And uh, we take faculty through six modules where they actually create eight different humanized online learn online teaching elements that are identified on the slide here. I'm not gonna get into these here today, but there's plenty of resources where you can dig deeper with them. And I wanna really stress that it's set within this context of warm demand or pedagogy that push and care at the same time. So the facilitators are modeling that. Uh, and we found in the feedback that that was absolutely critical. 98% of the participants completed the academy, which was huge. That's a really high success rate for professional development. 96% responded to a feedback survey and rated it 4.6 out of five stars. Some of the themes that surfaced were the relationship with the warm demand or facilitator increased my confidence and engagement. So that's really critical. And it's why we need to be pushing away from all self-paced professional development, okay? Online professional development, when it's facilitated, has the impact to make bigger mindset shift changes. That's what we're finding as a result of this. Um, the content was research-based and it was very practical. Those were things that participants really liked. Here's a quote from one of our participants. I carried many traumas and pains from my own undergraduate STEM experience. It was not in it was not the course material that was challenging for me. And she's talking about when she was a student, it was the feeling of not being cared for and simply being a number on my ID card. I felt I was a dollar commodity for the department and not a person. Now I have a deeper understanding of myself and how I can improve my courses. In many ways, I've held myself back from my true nature and I've tried to work within what I thought were the rigid expectations for a professor. However, I now have a deeper understanding of how important emotions are in learning. Another one of our participants, um, Carrie Byrne has shared, as a younger female professor, I believe I needed to put on a tough outer shell in the classroom and uphold rigid expectations so that students wouldn't take advantage of my kindness or vulnerability. What I've realized in the past year is that that was a terrible misconception I held on to for much too long. And one of the things that we unpack together um, is how this, what Carrie's describing here, being a young female professor and kind of resisting what she wanted to do to take on this, you know, construct of what a professor is supposed to be, that's very much stereotype threat. And in the academy, we talk about stereotype threat in the context of what students experience, but being able to transfer it to one's own identity is extremely powerful. One of my most valuable takeaways is the notion of a compassionate demander. This is from Samaya McCleave, who's a math instructor at Saddleback. The two concepts are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they go well together. By accepting late work and allowing second chances and corrections, I put the emphasis on the quality of my students' work. Holding all students to high expectations about the quality of their work keeps the focus on their learning. Holding them to a timeline privileges students who have more time and fewer additional responsibilities. So the research study that we ran alongside of this, which now I'm getting to, um, and I'm, um, I probably am cramming too much information in here, sorry folks. Number one, um, 
what our, our research questions are, what is the influence of the humanizing online STEM Academy on faculty perceptions and online teaching behaviors? And what are the experience of students in humanized online STEM courses? I don't want to say that or create the illusion that I did this all by myself. We have a whole team of researchers at UC Irvine who are working on this. It's a ton of qualitative data that we've collected. Um, and if you want to dig deeper into the, the, the data collection, you'll learn more on this slide here. Um, essentially, I'm just going to highlight some of the details here. Uh, we had a, the full sample, we conducted two waves of instructors uh, surveys, and then we also did student surveys in their humanized courses after the, the academy was over. So instructors completed a, a, a survey um, before the academy and after the academy, and then when they started teaching their courses, their students completed a survey week two and at the end of the course. We also did a deep dive sample of 10 participants um, that were interview based. And um, we did three longitudinal interviews, one before the academy, one after the academy, and then one after they taught their humanized course. So those are the same 10 faculty. And we also did student focus groups. We had 20 students that participated either in small group focus, small focus groups or individual interviews. Um, this gets into some of the demographics, uh, which I'm not going to go through, but you certainly do have access to. And I do want to point out that with our students, we did have 50% of our student um, sample were from minoritized racial groups, which breaks down to our Black, Hispanic, Native American, and Pacific Islander students. So some of our preliminary findings um, with regards to the faculty um, so let me answer Lynn's question. Lynn is asking, what about success rates? Um, it's fascinating that that's the first thing everybody wants to go to, right? And I'll tell you that that's where we intended to go with the study. But when COVID hit, we couldn't. Because if you're going to do a pre-post and say that this intervention made this change, you have to really be able to justify that that's the only change that happened. Now, that's hard in any course. But when everything changed, like it did with COVID, there was no way we could run that study and come out and say, hey, look, and we didn't know what the results would be anyway, right? So that's why we shifted gears and we did a qualitative study. That's where we're starting with our research. We do have plans if we get additional funding to move forward and continue that research though and look at success rates. So what we're seeing though, is we're starting with our faculty and trying to understand the impact of professional development on faculty, which is a hugely under, it's a very murky space, folks. Um, and what we're seeing is an increase in faculty confidence with teaching online, their perceptions of the role that an instructor plays in improving student achievement. Now for the, some of us who are very deeply entrenched in humanizing, in uh, equitable teaching and learning, right? We know this. For a lot of faculty though, there's, there's resistance to that idea. So we're seeing a shift in that mindset and that's really, really important. An increase in the perception of the role that instructor plays in closing equity gaps. It's not all on the students, what I do matters. An increase in the awareness of the differences that students bring to a class and an increase in a willingness to intentionally accommodate those student differences. All of these things have to be in place. So if our, if our intervention, our professional development isn't doing these things, then that's a problem. So um, I just wanna really kind of underscore that. And uh, also changes in instructional practices after the academy faculty are more actively engaged in promoting instructor to student social interaction, student to student interactions, student to content interactions, we're seeing that they're saying that they, they're more flexible with their course policies and grading. And they're also more intentional about being approachable online. They're really thinking about, like, even if I feel that I'm approachable, I may not come across as approachable online. And that's where these eight humanizing elements really come into play to equip uh, faculty with the ability to be approachable. A quote from a faculty, I always wanted to really help students, but I was too terse. So I tried to be more friendly and just more open-minded in terms of what they're coming to me with. And I felt that it really changed the climate of the course in terms of students feeling comfortable to come to me. 
prior to this class, I always felt like an instructor was at this level, I'm going to assume, and your students are down here at this level. And, and really, after the humanizing online STEM course, I realized we're a team. And the less I view it as a hierarchy, the better my outcomes are. Now on the student side, um, we're seeing that overall students in the humanized online STEM courses are reporting high levels of satisfaction across the board, including high levels of a sense of belonging, high instructor to student relationships, they're ranking that category high, teaching presence, social presence, and attitudes towards online learning. Um, and social presence, for those of you unfamiliar with that idea, is the, the feeling that you're engaging with a real person online, as opposed to just a name on a screen. In both the week two and, and of course, surveys, our racially minoritized students reported higher levels of the following measures when compared to white and Asian peers sense of belonging, instructor to student relationships, teaching presence, and cognitive presence. So again, I want us to remember that if we kind of picture equity gaps, like a bar graph in our mind and picture those gaps, we really need to be emphasizing these things, these elements, these constructs on the screen here to really ensure that we are digging into those, what I like to call opportunity gaps, right? So. Um, this is a really exciting and important finding here. Uh, we also know that racially minoritized students had greater increases in most constructs from week, week two to the, um, to the end of the course survey with significant increases in a sense of belonging and student to student interactions. We did see um, an, a decrease in cognitive presence, um, which was a little bit interesting. And I, this is a quote from a STEM student. I know that she does care and I know that she does want to help me. So I'm willing to reach out if I need to, which is evidence of that um, approachability. We find from the student focus groups that students are sharing, there are clear expectations, the, uh, citing the use of, of rubrics in the classes that they're receiving timely feedback. Uh, one of our other findings that I really wanna underscore was that the students have indicated that there's a real need to further strengthen student to student interactions, which I think would be like the next phase of, of humanizing. We get into why student to student interactions are so important in the course. And actually two of the eight humanizing elements do focus on student to student interactions, but we found that one of them was the least likely adopted in the course. Um, and we also encourage the use of an asynchronous voice or video tool like Flipgrid, which is free or VoiceThread if faculty have access to that. And uh, what we found in the research, what, well, one of our hypotheses is that faculty, um, that was one of, those are some of the lower likely adopted elements is because they do require that additional tool not only for faculty to navigate and use, but they also require students to use an additional tool. And some of our faculty felt a bit reluctant about bringing students into that. So that's an area that, um, that we can improve upon. We have a website that we put together at humanizeol.org. And I encourage you to go there if you wanna learn more. Um, I can show you around there a little bit. This is the home page. Um, if you go into, well, let me just scroll down. These are kind of the three main areas. You can learn more about the Academy. You can request the free toolkit that'll give you access to lots of goodies, including a PDF of our preliminary research findings. If you'd like to share that with anybody, we encourage you to do so. Um, and then we also want to encourage you to stay connected to, to get additional updates um, as our project will hopefully continue to evolve. Um, I wanted to share under resources, we also have an interactive infographic, which is a great way to dig in and learn a little bit more about humanizing. And it's interactive uh, down at the bottom when you get into the eight elements, you'll see these links where you can see examples and learn more about any of the eight elements. So we have, I think that was my last slide there. Um, oh, if you're up for another day of professional development next week, folks, 
um, don't come to the 9:30. Uh, the, the don't come to the first session because you'll basically hear a repeat of what I just did. Uh, but we do have a half day humanizing online STEM summit where we'll be inviting uh, several participants from the academy to share in a panel. Um, we also have a great keynote speaker, Dr. Mika Estrada. Um, so we invite you to register if you're interested or just spread the word. If you want anyone else to kind of hear the message that was shared here today, that's an opportunity to do so. Um, yeah, and that is the end. So I'm going to stop sharing and see if there's any questions or just comments, dialogue. Yeah, hi, Tamina, thank you for your question. Anyone is welcome to participate on May 4th for sure. It's open to the public. We have about a little over 200 people registered right now from across the nation. Most folks are from the California Community College system, but we do have a, a national audience that will be chiming in. Did I miss any? I don't think I missed any questions, um, but oh, here, a logistical question from Pam. So yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. Let me just read your question here, Pam, so I have my head wrapped around it. I see the value of flexibility with due dates, but how does that work if the instructor needs to release a key that students who have completed on time need to study or use for an upcoming assignment? Um, I think that scaffolding I don't know what you mean by a key. So that's, I don't know how to, how to respond to that. Um, I think the scaffolding is critical and I think that's all part of your facilitation. Um, I think what's important to, to, for me as a teacher when I, I, I allow late work for everything. But the first thing I say to my students is every assignment has a due date and your goal is to meet those due dates. Meeting the due dates is your pathway to success in this class. But if you miss one, if something comes up and you have a week where all hell breaks loose, you take care of what you need to take care of and know that you can turn those assignments in late. So I think that what my sense is that many faculty have this perception that everyone's going to turn everything in late. And maybe that could be the case. I don't know. But you really do have a lot of power in how you facilitate that. And really putting the accountability on students, you know, like, yeah, it is going to be a problem if you, if you continue to turn in late work because you're going to not have access to these things. So that's all part of the teaching. Um, so I don't know if that helps a little bit, but uh, Casey, would you like to share? We have three more minutes. I think you can unmute. Is Casey able to unmute herself, uh, Kevin? She should be able to. Um, um, the only option I have is to ask to unmute. So let me see if I can just click and see what happens. Okay. Oh, so you're using the requirements, I see, Pam. Yeah, it, it, I can see how you'd have to kind of rethink things a bit. This is when having conversations with peers is the most important thing to do for professional development, like asking those questions and getting advice. I, I think that's a great solution. I'm sorry, Casey. It looks like you're having some trouble unmuting yourself. Casey, if you if you continue to have that challenge, feel free to use the chat. Thank you for your feedback, Wendy. Thanks for being here. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat. I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has um, something that, that comes to mind later. Um, yeah, I think we're at a just about time. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. Oh, that's okay. Me yeah, we do hear you. you know, I like raised my hand and then Zoom did the wheel of death. And it's like, well, <laughs> thanks for that Zoom. That is a little cosmic irony. So we're in the process right now of designing a training program um, at Portland Community College for online instructors. And like 
this morning, we were talking about how to fashion the modules around student engagement and teacher presence. Those split up. And you know, so much of this you mentioned is like that self reflection. And I guess I'm just wondering about when you were designing that canvas training, and I'll certainly check it out myself. Um, when it comes to that, like direct application, like, how did you weigh that when you were designing a training course that they had to like, go out and use the stuff? Did you was it? I don't know, I'm thinking like 80 20, like 80% self reflection and 20% here's something to do right now or just kind of ballparking. I, I've, I've never thought about like trying to, to weigh it like that. Um, every single module is heavy with hands on. There's something in every single module that we are having faculty go out and I should say participants go out and create. Um, and we're having them create it in their, like we have faculty from all different institutions. So they're creating in their local instance of Canvas and sometimes bringing screenshots back, sometimes making tours with video and bringing it back. And then there's, a, there's sharing. So some of the faculty to fa or participant to participant dialogue is around discussing what they made and other things are more reflective. So um, it's kind of all across the board. We try to bring in sharing, but also that reflection. And you know, as with anything, the degree to which the participants reflect really varies. We have some people who are really critical, re critically reflecting and sharing really insightful takeaways and others not so much. So I think that is really important to remember that you know, you're looking for growth in everybody. So you're looking for a change from one place to another and it's gonna look different for everyone. Um, and it's important to encourage, remind participants that too, because there's a lot of that perfectionism that comes into play, especially yeah, when you definitely. start sharing your work, right? So talking about vulnerability <clears throat> and why it's important to learn, lean into vulnerability and demonstrating that as a facilitator is so critical. I'm really good at demonstrating that because I'm not, I'm, I'm messy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Um, how much time did they get to complete like each, how much time were they expected to spend in the course each week? It's designed to, to take about 10 hours per week, but at the end yeah. we asked folks how long they took and some folks took 10 hours, some folks took six hours, some people said there were modules that were closer to 15 and higher than that. Okay. Again, varies based upon who the person is, the technology skills, what they're looking to get out of it. But that's, that's kind of the mindset that we go into the course with. Seems like that um, hefty stipend maybe was a big point of grace around time. I, that is why I'm really underscoring institutional investment. Yeah. yeah. That I, I know that, you know, typically compensating faculty for professional development can be kind of a dicey topic and everyone has different cultures at their institutions, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. And if you're going to expect a lot of time and commitment and work out of, out of participants, then, you know, looking into like reassigned time or compensation, which both are compensation is, is really important. Um, Lynn, to, uh, to address your question, we don't have a, an openly facilitated session planned. We've only shared the course with an open license, which you can learn more about on the, um, on the website, humanizeol.org. But I encourage you to sign up for updates because um, as the, the project hopefully does continue, we'll be able to share, keep in touch with you and keep you informed about future updates that way. Well, Michelle, I want to thank you again for sharing the details, but also just the that just demonstrating the empathy that you um, help all of us try to follow your example. So um, this doesn't have to stop here. I posted in the chat the Padlet link for folks to continue adding their comments and questions. And um, as we turn our attention to the next session that'll start in about 10 minutes in this room, uh, please take care of yourselves, get some water, walk around, and we hope to see you in rooms A, B, or C uh, very soon. But Michelle, thank you so much for this presentation and for your, your work. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Kevin. So good to see you.